Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Walk with me immediately. Somebody say immediately. Immediately. Jesus came from uh, entertaining the crowd, sending the crowd away, not entertaining the crowd, ministering to the crowd, sending the crowd away. And then when he came, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he stayed and he dismissed the crowd. In verse 23, after he had dismissed them, he went on, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. It's like 12 sermons in this. My gosh. Help me, Holy Ghost. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was also a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And shortly before, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Somebody say, incredible. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately sent to them, said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. They said, Lord, if it's Peter says, rather, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus says, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid beginning to sink he cried out Lord save me and immediately Jesus reached out his hand called him and then he admonished him you of little faith why did you doubt verse 32 and when he climbed into the boat when they climbed into the boat when they climbed into the boat when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Now it's time for us to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus right now, we yield our hearts to you. We turn towards heaven because we need to hear a word that will liberate our thinking and transform our entire lives. I praise you and I honor you and I thank you right now that you sent us here on this day to experience this dynamic move. Thank you that this is a celebratory weekend, not just because of the 19 years, but because of the eternity that you gave us access to. Thank you for Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that in this moment, you're about to give us access to the treasure chest of your word, that we might pull out nuggets that will breathe life even into our dead situations. Cancel every distraction, every demonic dart, and every vice that has been launched against our hearing and our heart. Lord, don't let anything permeate in our head and our thoughts right now that should not be. Do not allow the, the spirit of distraction to take authority over this moment, but help us to hear and to see and to experience you in another way. Heal the broken pieces. Put the broken pieces back together again and restore again our fellowship with you. We didn't come for them, but we really came for you. So speak, God because we're listening. Now it's your turn. I need you to pray that God would move in this place, that he would speak a word that will minister to your need. You know exactly what the needs are before anybody ever utters them. Come on, you talk to him yourself. Yeah, he's a God that says, you can come to me. He that believeth in God must believe that he is. And you can be rewarded for seeking him for yourself. Come on, this is the diligence of the moment. Do it, Lord, do it, Lord. 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 Now there's some people in your section and on your road, people around you. I need you to pray for them. Pray that whatever God is speaking in this atmosphere, that it will bless them in your household. If you're joining me around the world right now, I need you to believe God that he's going to do what needs to be done. No, you got to pray in faith. That means you pray in confidence, that you pray with courage. You pray with boldness. Come on, right now, this is your moment. Talk to him. He's your father. He's your heavenly father. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Pray that God would bless the messenger, that he would send the anointing that is needed in order to preach with efficacy, preach with the authority of Jesus Christ, preach with the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray right now in the name of Jesus. Yes, God. Yes, God. 
do it, Lord. You sent us here. You set us up. Even around the world, those who are watching right now, we agree with you in prayer. We believe by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ that everything that your heart desires, because you are delighting yourself in him, he's going to unlock, unfold, release, and give you access to the truths of the Lord, but more importantly, to the favor of God that's going to fall as a result of your time in his truth. I thank you, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus on behalf of every person that has turned their hearts towards you and affixed their minds towards heaven. I praise you, I honor you, I bless you, and I thank you even now in advance that what you are about to do in us, with us, to us, for us, and through us will be marvelous and will be matchless and that nobody will be able to get the credit but our mighty Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise your name, O oh God, for just being our incredible God. You are worthy of this moment. You are worthy of this time. You are worthy for all that you have given to us. This is the least that we could do is to come and give you our attention, give you our worship, give you our adoration, our adulation, give you our inspiration, give you the exuberant praise that is due unto your holy name. Now, God, kill our ignorance with your truth cause the profundity of your word to resonate and permeate in every component and every crevice and every crack of our existence so that we are not leaving here the same way that we came. Break and destroy every yoke of bondage and get the glory, get the glory above and beyond all, get the glory in Jesus' name. Oh, come on, shout it in Jesus' name. Somebody give God glory in advance. No, you playing with it in Jesus' name. G-Star. In Jesus' name. I told you I was going to tell you when you came. In Jesus' name. Somebody open your mouth and praise God on the level of your expectation. Glory to his name. Slap somebody high five on your way down and say, God is incredible. Come on, do it again like you really mean it. Shout, God is incredible. I am going to tell you, you know, I'm sharing my personal feelings and sentiment in this moment in that I'm really, I'm, I'm, it's a bittersweet. I'm so excited that God has favored us with the word and with the truth that he's given us over the course of this month. It has been revelatory. It has been mind-blowing. It has been life-altering. It has been dream-building. It has been hope-giving to me. I can't speak for you, but preaching these has not just been for you. I know that many times you feel like that the pastor comes to preach and he wants to preach to you. No, I was preaching to us and I have left here full every single week. I'm almost sad now. This is the bittersweet of it. I'm almost sad that I only have one more week to preach on this particular subject. God is in Oh, you got to act like you mean it this time. God is in God is so incredible and I'm still feasting off of the the revelation knowledge that now unto him who is able to do over above beyond beyond for any time any place any cause until it becomes excessive that's an incredible God what God is willing to do for you. And we, of course, we learned that God is able and we know God is also willing, but we also learned, I think maybe last week it was, that we learned that he's not obligated, that there's some prerequisites to the promise, that he's an if-then kind of God. If you do these things, then he does these things. If you do this, then I'll do that. He is an if-then kind of God. Uh, because he, he requires certain aspects of your existence, your life, your hope to be in position so that he then can be honored, get the glory, but more importantly, can honor his truth to himself and release the favor and the blessing that he desires to give into your life. Y'all still with me? In other words, God wants to bless you. But many times you are your own worst enemy because you are the prohibitive factor that will not allow him to bless you. If God gives a condition, then it is as he has spoken it. He is the kind of God that he cannot lie. When he speaks a thing, it becomes what he has spoken it. 
And it is inevitable that it will be what he has said it will be. Which means also that when he puts a principle or a process or a practice in place, he cannot break the principle. He cannot change the process. It has to happen as he has spoken it. Otherwise, it would make him fallible in his truth and he would be a lie. And so uh, in order for you to receive the promise, the benefits of the promise, you're going to have to honor his process and you're going to have to honor the practices that he has prescribed. Otherwise, you won't be able to see what God has said. Are y'all with me? Okay, let me do it this way. When God says, he that cometh to me must believe that I am, the moment you break the process and then you come with him, you come to him with doubt, then you limit his ability to honor the latter part of what he's spoken in that he will reward those who diligently seek him. The diligence is your ability to remain consistent. That's what diligent is, is that you're consistent, you're consistent, you're consistent. He can count on you. He can count on you to trust him. He can count on you to believe in him. He can count on you to honor him. He can count on you to praise him. He can count on you to serve him. He can count on you. And when God can count on you, he then releases his divine rewards. And God's rewards, my goodness, listen, I'm about to hurt myself thinking about it. When God rewards you, it's, a, it's several factors that get me excited. First of all, it's going to be like nothing you could do on your own. Exceeding, abundantly, above, until it's excessive. It's going to be way beyond your own capacity to ask it or even to think on the level of the favor that God's rewards will give your life. And here's the other thing. If you read on in the text, remember we dealt with this, that when you get to the conclusion of God's declaration, he simply says, amen, which means that nobody will be able to stop it, to block it, to hinder it, to halt it. It doesn't matter what they think, what they feel, what they say, what they thought. At the end of the day, when God gives you his incredible favor, nobody can tell Take it from you. You, it is what he says it is. Somebody tell God, thank you. I'm so glad because there are some haters who've been nipping at my heels and they would love to take everything that God wants to give me. Some people who've been trying to sow seeds of doubt and trying to get me to go into disbelief. People that have been trying to uh, tell me what I can't do, tell me where I won't go, tell me what I won't have. But I have gotten to the truth and now the truth shall make me free. Now I am free indeed because the, the Savior himself has already given me his divine promise that if I just keep praying, keep worshiping, keep thanking, keep going, keep persevering, keep believing, keep hoping, keep moving, keep progressing, keep reaching keep come on somebody understand if I stay in a consistent posture that I am always looking for God to do incredible things guess what incredible things are about to happen in my life where are my diligent people who didn't show up to appease your neighbor but you came because you were seeking God to say what needs to be seen Oh, bless his name, bless his name. God is incredible. God is mind-blowing good. God is so incredible that there are not even words in the English language to adequately explain the nature and the magnificence and the magnitude of what he is capable of doing. The problem with many of us is that we've been our own preventative factor because we don't believe that he is able. When you move in doubt, you actually also move in fear. They literally go hand in hand. They are evil twins. And when you move in doubt, it automatically brings about a sense of fear because the doubt comes because you don't know if, you are, if it's safe for you to actually put your trust or your confidence in the abilities of your God. And so, in order to get God to do what only God can do. He's able, he's willing, but he's not obligated. The scripture said, I showed it to you, the scripture said that he, he would have passed them by. He's not obligated except to himself, except to his truth. So then you have to now learn what are all the prerequisites necessary, and I started it last week, but what are the prerequisites necessary in order to activate the promise of God in my life? 
in order to see God do incredible things, what do I have to bear and to bring to the table? First of all, you've got, you've got to understand faith. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, without faith, it's what? Impossible. Say it again, it's what? So say for your neighbor's sake, it's what? Impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It's impossible to please God without faith. So in order for you to see God do incredible things, faith is a prerequisite and purpose is the power. I'll put that where you can feel it because you're going to need that in a few minutes. Faith is the prerequisite and purpose is the power. So, so faith is the prerequisite to seeing God do incredible things because it's what the scripture has given us. You cannot please God and in order to see him reward you, you must diligently seek him. And if you're coming to him, he says, don't come to me in doubt. Come to me believing that I am who I say that I am. So understand faith. Understanding faith is so important because if you don't have a great understanding of what faith looks like, what it feels like, what it requires, what it, what it, what it means for your journey, then you're not going to be able to walk in something you don't understand. And if you don't understand it, you are limiting God's ability to do what God desires to do. I need you to know he wants to bless you. No, he wants to favor you. He wants to entirely blow your mind. But you won't get out of your own way. I know we want to blame everybody else. We want to think this is everybody else's fault. This is why. And I, if it hadn't been that I was abusing my childhood, if I hadn't gone through this, if I hadn't dealt with this, if I hadn't been here, if this hadn't happened, if that hadn't happened. But what is stopping you now? You have to move out of your own way so that you can understand faith and make sure that your faith is not misappropriated. And here's what has happened to many of us. Our faith has been hindered because we start treating God like man. In other words, we start looking at God through the flaws of mankind. But God is God is God is God is God all by himself. He is not like man. He is the only one that can really legitimately say they're not like us. Ain't nobody else got that power but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who can look upon us and say, our thoughts are not your thoughts. Our ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my ways from all of mankind. God is the only one that really has the ability to say that. And so the problem is because we've experienced human pain and human frailty and human fallenness, we start treating God like he possesses human qualities. Which then kills our capacity to walk in faith because we don't really believe that he's going to do what he said he's going to do and loves us like he says he loves us and will honor his word like he says he'll honor his word. And at that point, you start doubting and you then walk in the ability, in your capacity rather, to, to doubt whether God has the ability to do what God promised he'll do. Here's how faith works. Faith operates on the notion that you may not immediately see it but it will eventually materialize or be realized. That's what faith does. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of the intangible things that you can't see yet. That's what the, that's what the Bible makes clear to us is that it's just because you can't see it yet. Faith says, but I already see it. Faith says, be, be foolish enough to apply anyway. Faith says, walk into it and walk like it's already yours. Faith says, position yourself so that the promise will be yours and act like it's been yours the whole time. I don't know who I'm preaching to right here, but you can't act like I think I can, I think I can, I think I... No, you got to walk in with a swag, white socks and all. You got to sit on television and sing like you were sent. Is there anybody else up in here who has the kind of confidence, the kind of boldness, and the kind of courage in your God that you can act like you're already favored? You're already... Come on, somebody understand... 
I may not look like what you think I look like or need to look like, but I know who I am because I know whose I am. As a matter of fact, hold my mule. I can shout right now. I'm shouting for my children. I'm shouting for my grandchildren. I'm shouting for my church. I'm shouting for his people. I'm shouting for my mama. I'm shouting for somebody give God glory on the level of your confidence. Oh, bless your name, God. I ain't got to wait till I see it. I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I'm the head, not the tail. I am above, not beneath. I'm the lender, not the borrower. I am born again. I was made to be seated in high places in Christ Jesus. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am healed. I am restored. I am delivered. I am wealthy in Christ Jesus. I know who I am know who I am slap somebody high five and say he talking about me right now talking about me right now know who I am sit down sit down down. I got too far to go here we go faith however is not passive it's active faith is not sitting back just waiting on it to fall in your lap no it is an active movement and it causes you to move even when circumstances watch this don't support it faith will cause you to move when you can't see it and it don't even make sense my circumstances and my situation don't support what I see but I see not by flesh I see in spirit and I'm seeing because God said it that's what faith will cause you to do Faith is deeply connected to trust. And let me tell you why trust is so important in the process of you acting by faith. It's because miracles do not happen in an instance. Yeah, it sometimes will happen over a process. I have to help you because some of us, we are expecting a miracle, but we think that the miracle has to happen right now. God specializes in making people wait it out. Where do you think the saying, he may not come when you want him, comes from? But he's always on. Because he specializes in waiting until the baby is dead and walking into the room and grabbing her by the hand saying to live the coom, little girl rise. He specializes in waiting till Lazarus is four days stinking in his grave and stepped in front of the tomb and says move the stone, Lazarus come forth. He specializes in waiting until your money is funny, your finances are fickle and your pennies are few and he breaks into your circumstance and lets divine manna fall into your life and makes a way, watch this, out of no way. He specializes in making you wait it out. So faith requires that you maintain your belief until, until your miracle manifests. That's what faith does. Faith requires that I got to maintain. In other words, you you can't get to the point where you become weary in your well-doing. The only reason weariness is here is because you're doing well. And in due season, here's the problem. You, You don't get to decide when the season is due. Who are you to think that you control the moon, the sun, the stars? Who are you to think that you control the orbit of the... As a matter of fact, you can't even dictate and determine what the season is going to be from one day to the next right here in Chicago. How you think you're going to determine the season of your life? Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. Give me one second. Preach, boy! Listen. Faith pushes you past the doubt and those who experience miracles let their faith dictate their circumstance. In other words, my circumstance is not dictated by what I see. It's only predicated on what he said. So my faith is going to cause me to act like people going to look at me and say, he lost his mind. He going to go and buy a whole building 
with Hobby Lobby as a tenant and they ain't got the money in the bank to do it. And he is. And did. He gonna go and buy a whole campus on the south side of Chicago and they don't even have the money. He made a cash offer in the name of the Lord. And they didn't even have the cash to pay for it and did. He going after a million souls added to the kingdom and they don't even have the army put together yet. And it's a lot of moving parts and they don't even have it completely figured out. And he is. Faith pushes you past doubt and it causes you to let your, your faith dictate the miracle and not your circumstance. So true faith, true faith rather, connects you to the supernatural. Now, I had to give you this foundation. Are y'all still with me? I got a long way to go. Please pray for me. Uh, faith connects you to the supernatural. Faith is the prerequisite. Faith is the prerequisite. Say it with me. Faith, faith. is the prerequisite. Because here's the thing. We know how incredible it is. I spent the first part of the month making sure you understood how incredible God is. What he is able to do, what he is willing to do. And, the, and how to begin the process of activating his, his incredible capacity. And so we, we understand that. But if you don't understand how to activate it for yourself, you will miss out on what God is capable of doing. Are you with me? So faith is the prerequisite. Say it again. Faith, faith. is the prerequisite. But well, here's the one. This is good. Purpose is the power. See, when you understand purpose and how powerful purpose is, you will not allow anybody to pull you outside of purpose. I'm not going to let my job, I wouldn't let the music business, I wouldn't let anybody pull me outside of my purpose. Because I recognize and I figured out early, I'm so grateful for this, I figured out early that purpose is powerful because it's the only thing that the enemy can't touch and can't change. The only way that you know the purpose of a thing is that you have to search the mind of the creator of the thing. Any usage outside of the creator's intended use is abuse or misuse. And so in order not to be abused or misused, you have to know and understand this was the intended purpose for this thing. And when I understand the purpose of this thing, I don't allow anybody to tell me that it's something else when I've, I've heard from the mouth of the individual, this is what it's for. The problem is you've let everybody else define your purpose and redefine your purpose. Okay, let me try this again. The problem is you have redefined your own purpose as if you were the one who created yourself. But we are fearfully and wonderfully created about, for, by a God who says your substance was not hidden from me. I knew you from the, the time that I formed you in your mother's womb. And I numbered every hair on your head. I know you inside and out. And I know what I created you to do. So faith is the prerequisite, but purpose is the power. And purpose, let me tell you what purpose does. This is why it's so powerful. Because purpose creates alignment that causes you to be at the right place at the right time to receive the miracle. When you start walking outside of God's purpose for your life, you are out of alignment. And if you're one degree off course, you can miss the intersection where God's timing intersects man's timing and the miracles are actually manifested. Purpose aligns you to God's divine timing. When there is a convergence of the right time, the right place, the right actions, it moves you into a position so that the miracle of God can occur in your life. Purpose, uh, it, 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 it positions you. I, I, I go back to 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings, the 17th chapter, it, where Elijah, Elijah was sent to the brook Besor. He says, leave this place. The season for this is over. Go to this brook or go in this territory that I'm taking you to. He goes to the brook. When he gets to the brook, it looks as if nothing is there. And God sends a bird which is notoriously a scavenger or a taker. And God sends a raven to come and bring him what he needed to sustain him. But he would have missed out on the provision of God, the miracle of God, if he had been anywhere but where God told him to go. 
So when he walked according to God's purpose, he was able to see the intersection of God's uh, uh, divine power in his his earthly circumstance. So purpose attracts what you need in order to fulfill that purpose for God's glory. You attract what you need when you're where you are supposed to be. Oh, this is good. Well, I wish I had time. I wish I had time. Because some of y'all ain't been where you're supposed to be. And if you haven't been where you're supposed to be, who knows how much you have missed out on receiving? Who knows how much you have not seen, how much unnecessary struggle you've had to endure, how much unnecessary pain, how how unnecessary extended and elongated processes you've had to endure just because you are out of alignment, you are not walking according to the power of God that worketh within you, and you did not walk according to your purpose. Purpose is the framework in which miracles are manifested. And you need to understand purpose and your purpose in God because it gives your faith meaning. See how they're married to each other. My faith means something when I am walking according to God's purpose for my life. How do you say that? It ensures that you're not just standing there waiting on some random events, but that you are actively participating in God's plan and you ultimately are honoring his purpose so you will experience his power. That's how it works. I had to show you this because I think many of you, you have been in your own way. What you expect, you will attract. If you don't expect it, you ain't going to attract it. Some of you have been expecting something that is not of God and you've been attracting exactly. See, this was Sunday service at 10 o'clock. I might say some few things, but this is the, this is the sophisticated service. But you've been attracting, yeah, he, he might look a certain way, he might smell good, but you've been attracting exactly what you've been expecting. Oh, my, 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 my. What you expect when you expect a miracle, you start preparing for God to do Everything that God promised you'll do mentally, spiritually, emotionally, you start making preparation. That's why your expectation and your hope has to be in God, not in things, not in your job, not in your money, not in your socioeconomic level, not in the White House, not in your Democratic or your Republican or your independent party, not in you got to place your hope in God because when you place your hope outside of God, you have misused, misabused, you have abused and misappropriated what God has purpose for your life and as a result of it you're going to attract exactly what you expect God wants to do the impossible he wants to do something that's so next level so incredible that people are blown away just watching your life and it's evident in the text I'm gonna run through this right quick the disciples y'all yeah we good the disciples were clearly Men of faith, they obviously were moving in purpose because the first thing that Jesus does when he gets through teaching, immediately, immediately he says, get in the boat and y'all go ahead on the other side. Note that they first of all overcame. We always deal with what happened in the boat, but I want to deal with before we even get in the boat, what happened before they got in the boat. The first thing that they had to do was overcome their fear. And why do you say that? Because it didn't say that they were afraid. Yeah, but in my humanity, I recognize that when God sends me into a territory, into a place, into a space that was unplanned and that I have no knowledge of what's happening on the other side, it can be terrifying. When God gives you an assignment and you don't understand where you're going in the assignment or how you're supposed to get over there or what's going to be waiting on you on the other side, it can prompt fear. So to overcome that and simply listen to him and he says, go to the other side and he's staying behind. Now, I can only imagine me as a disciple. It's like, no, 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 no. Well, what you going to do? Because I'm riding with you. I haven't seen what you can do. You just broke five, you, you just fed 5,000 uh, folk with some sardines and some crackers. Where you go, I'm going. 
He says, no, you go ahead. I'm going to stay here and dismiss the crowd. And watch this. They all got in the boat and they all went out towards the other side which means that they had to overcome fear of getting into the boat and going into the unknown. That was the first thing that they did in order to start the process of God activating the incredible and performing a miracle in their lives. Because when God sends you into something, you don't always know what it is or even what to expect, but what he is expecting is obedience. Because obedience is the key to unlocking the incredible in your life. You can't say I'm walking in purpose and you're walking in disobedience. The moment you start walking disobedient to God's instructions for your life, you have left purpose and you have abandoned his power. So now you're limited to your own capacity. You can only do what you can do. And so in verse 26, a few verses later, they get out in the middle of the water. A storm comes. And the text says that the men cried out for fear. Now, you told us to go. I went. We jumped in the boat. We get out here and it's a storm coming. And we see you. Well, we see a figure walking towards us on the water. And the text says that they cried out in fear. Here's the challenge. If you were obedient enough, faithful enough to trust him enough to get in the boat and take out across the water towards the other side, how is it that when something comes that you don't recognize, you lose that confidence that you had and now you're crying out in fear? And, and that's literally what we do. We lose hope in the middle of the journey because we got in the boat excited. Jesus said, go to the other side. We're going to do what Jesus said. We are riding with the Lord. Oh, bless God. Pastor, we are with the Lord. We're doing what the Lord has said. Then you cannot be terrified when something pops up that is unfamiliar or that you do not recognize. You got to trust him the same way when you're in the boat as you did before you got in the boat. You got to trust him all the way. You can't just trust him when it's cool, calm, and collected, but you got to trust him even when you don't understand what you see. You panicked because it didn't look like you thought it was supposed to look. You panicked because you got down the road and it started looking like it was something that was terrifying and something that you didn't recognize. I'm in a season that don't look like what I thought it was supposed to look like. So now I'm crying out in fear. God has not given you the spirit of fear but of love, of power, and a sound mind. And the fact that he sent you should be enough. I got to sit here for a second. The fact that he puts you on the course means that should be enough. That's why he says, trust me with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, I need you to just say, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. They, they, they just messed with my babies, but God, I trust you. The doctor just gave me a bad report, but God, I trust you. I just lost my loved one, but God, I trust you. It don't make sense to me, but God, I trust you. I can't understand what they're doing in government, but God, I trust you. Lord, I don't know how it's going to come together, but God, I trust you. Because you never would have sent me in it if you weren't going to keep me through it. If you weren't going to protect me, shield me, cover me, lift me, bring me. You never would have put me in it if you weren't going to bring me through it. God, I trust you. I don't know how many of you ever had days where you had to speak to yourself. I had to talk to myself. God, the money is funny and it's drying up and I don't know how you're going to make it work, but God, I trust you. Let me just testify. Give it honor to God who is the head of my life. When I got ready to get in this building, we ran out of money. 
We had no more money and I had a date that God had set in my heart. I had spoken it over the congregation. I told everybody over a decade ago, we're going and this is the date that we're going in. We get to the end of it. We have no more money. Everything has dried up because we weren't using the bank's money. The bank wouldn't give us any money. God says, no, if the bank gives it to you, it ain't going to be incredible. If I do it, you're going to know that I am God. Your people are going to be able to see and hear this testimony at the 19th year and it will remind them that the same God at 10 years is still with them at 19 years. He says it's got to be incredible. We run out of money. We sitting in the office. Everybody's trying to figure out what we're going to do and all of a sudden y'all got to give me a minute because it's personal for me. I'm starting to shout by myself. All of a sudden, I get a check in the mail. Royalties came in that I didn't even know was coming, that I wasn't even expecting at that particular moment. And right at that particular time, I got the biggest royalty check I had ever received in my entire life. And I said, keep the party going. Call the contractors. We going in on the day that the Lord has. God, I trust you. Yes, God. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. <laughs> now under him. I got to stop that thing. Who is able? Watch this. To do over, above, and beyond, beyond, for any time, any place, any reason, until it's... Watch this. Watch this. My wife and I sacrifice. We struggle. We scrape. We save. We sacrifice with the congregation because we believe in example leadership. Ain't gonna ask you to do nothing that we ain't gonna do. We gave up our private planes. Oh Lord. We ain't been able to get back there since. We gave up our private flights. We wouldn't buy anything new, no new vehicles, no new clothes. If I wasn't performing, we wouldn't buy it. We just, we sacrificed greatly. We sacrificed for the house of the Lord. We sacrificed for the people of God. We sacrificed for the purpose, for the divine assignment that was on our lives, right? Don't miss this. I'm done. I, I'm, I'm going to move on, right? But we, we made the sacrifice. We get in the church. We had a beautiful celebration. We had rental center chairs. Y'all remember that? Them little cheap rental chairs. We, oh, but we danced and shouted in the house. We had a bucket right here because the roof was leaking. We couldn't afford to put a $300,000 roof. I had a bucket and a barrel sitting right here and the drops was coming. I said, that's just rain from heaven. Don't y'all worry about it. He done opened the windows of heaven. He pouring out blessings. Just shout in there, how? Y'all remember that? I, I, I'm, 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 I'm telling you because, because I, I watched God do exceeding abundantly above. I watched him go over and above and beyond. Then he went beyond, beyond for that time, for that place, for this cause. But I hadn't seen excessive until, until I get a phone call from my wife who says, hey, one of our members, they're moving out of their home. And, and, and it's basically, you know, it's a very, 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 very nice home. Uh, and uh, we should go see it. I said, okay, cool. How much is it? She told me how much it was. I said, oh, we, we, we gotta go see that. We good, good. No, no, uh -uh. we good, we, we good. She says, no, honey, you don't understand. We just gotta go see it. So I said, no, we ain't gonna see that. I'm not in the business of teasing myself, no. We can't afford nothing like that. God says, uh, uh, my wife stays on it. For one year, she prays. She prays. She, she prays and she watches. And she keeps circling in front of the house. And she keeps watching it. And she keeps praying over it. About a year later, she come back to me. We laying in the bed. Y'all real sneaky. We laying in the bed. And she said, honey, the house is still available. I said, well, glory to God. Ain't got nothing to do with me. She said, your house is still available. I said, okay, all right, that's great. She says, but the price has changed. I said, okay, that's just, amen. 
Now leave me alone about this house now. You can't afford that. I done gave up the music thing. I'm all preaching now. Just leave me alone. And she says, she says, no, no, look, no, look at the price. I saw the price. It was about less than 60% less. I said, well. I said, let, let, let's, go, let's go check it out. And then she sets me up and takes me to a house that was one fourth of the, of the house that we were going to look at. She takes me to that house and she shows me that price point. Well, that price point was where I told her, don't talk, don't talk to me. Don't, no, we ain't going to see that. And then she takes me to this house and so I see the price point. Then, you know, I like what I like. You know, I like cherry wood. You know, that's just that down south in me. You know, I just like, I like what I like. Y'all with me? I likes what I like. You know, I like, I like, you know, neat, you know, modern, contemporary. Give me, you know, give me transitional. Don't give me, don't give me retro. Don't give me old school. Don't, I don't like that. So, of course, I get to the house, and guess what it is? Old school. Retro. Whole lot of stuff. Whole lot of stones and stuff. I said, oh, okay. I said, oh, okay, this is great. Oh, this is nice. Then they told me how much it cost. It had gone down some more. Then my realtor told me how much equity we would come into the moment that we signed the papers because it was at the end of the housing market's crash. And he told me how much... I said, oh, this is nice. Look at this. Ooh, we. Oh, look at this is nice. Ooh, woo. So then I got a thug in Christ that I'm married to. She go gangster in the, she go ghost gangster in the Holy Ghost. When she talked to God, she talked to God. So she she tells the real, she says, go make this offer. Now watch this. She made an offer for was way less than even the discounted price that they made. I mean, way less. To the extent that he laughed. And said, they ain't going for this. Then she called our members who used to own the house, told them, they said, nah, I know what other people have offered. They're not going to go for that. I said, oh, okay. Honey, they're not going to go for that. Make the offer. She makes the offer. They called me in the airport and said, Pastor, you ain't going to believe it. They accepted the offer. Now unto him. Y'all missed it. Let me help you see it. We sacrificed for his purpose. We got God's people in his house. And he said, I'm going to show you the kind of God I am when you are walking in purpose, when you trust me on this side and that side, when you trust me even in the middle of it, I will blow your mind. So what I did for my house, I'm about to blow your mind and bless you with your house. Don't wait for your neighbor. Shout on the level of your expectation. When I think of his goodness, oh my God, when I think of his, woo, when I think of his goodness, I didn't even tell y'all the excessive part. The excessive part is that we close in about 12 days. So when we bought the church, they asked for everything except for my children's DNA because I had to guarantee the loan. So they had, the bank had everything. 
And as soon as the house became available at a price point that the Lord would not allow me to walk away from, I called the same bank and asked them would they do the loan. And they said, for you, pastor, absolutely we will. We're sitting at the closing table. And the lady says, how did y'all do this? We now under him. Down, please sit down, sit down. Real quick, come on, come on, come on, go. Just don't move. Real quick, because I got to, I got to teach you this. Because here's the thing: you will look at my life, you will look at our testimony, you will look at what we what somebody else is doing, and you will discount yourself. He ain't just incredible in the Norfolk house. He is incredible in your house. He ain't just incredible in my kids. He's incredible in your kids. He ain't just incredible for me. He's incredible for you. When the disciples were out in the middle of a storm, they saw God do incredible things. But you got to know, how is it that they were able to see the incredible in their life. I need you to pay attention. Verse 28, right quick. He says, if, if it's you, Peter says, command me to come. The first thing that you're going to have to do when you, if you want to see incredible in your life is you're going to have to learn how to call for a word. Frequently, people plead for provision, but they don't pursue his perspective. You, 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 you often want to demand deliverance, but you disregard his direction. You want the resources, but you don't want the direction. He says, no, if you really want to see God do incredible, start calling for his word in your life. You got married to somebody with no direction. You left a church without asking God for direction. You quit a job without asking God. You bought a house. You took a position and not once did you stop and say, God, send me your word. You have to learn how to talk to him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You got to learn how to talk to him first because here's the problem. When you get in trouble, then you want to come and talk to him and you want him to fix it. He says, no, go talk to the person that told you to do it because God will pay his bill, but he's going to let you pay your own. Have you prayed about it? Did you seek the Lord on it? Did you find the word to confirm his will for your circumstance? Did you, did, you, did you check the fruit and did it align with the fruit that God says is a part of his spirit? Did you even get yourself seasons to go through to see if the person really manifested fruit that remains? Oh, I'm going to help y'all today. If you can't say amen, just say ouch. Here's the thing. God is talking. You just don't want to hear what he has to say. It's not a matter of him talking. He is always speaking. He'll speak through people. He'll speak through billboards. He'll speak through songs. He'll speak through sermons. His word speaks to you when you read it every single time. You'll see things that you've never seen before in a way that you've never seen it because God is always speaking. It's just you don't want to hear what he's saying. So before you step into something, you better be like Peter and say, Lord, if it's you, send me a word. God didn't tell you to take your tithes and do good deeds. He says, bring it to me. Send me a word. 
He didn't tell you to use your money to go and have a good time and then beg for what you need. He says, no, I need you to honor me and be a good steward of the resources. So here's, here's what I learned this from Pastor John Jenkins. Pro progressive versus preventative. A preventative is when you walk with God and, and you, you, you do it in a posture or do it in a way that is preventative. In other words, Lord, this is how you pray. Lord, if this is not, if this is not from you, then, then stop me. I'm going to go ahead and do this unless you stop me. Oh, come on. You've, you've done it. Lord, if this ain't, if this ain't you, just, no, no, no. That's preventative. But progressive is when you say, I'm not going to move until you tell me to. I'm not going to keep walking into this and you haven't told me this is what I'm supposed to walk into. There is where I'm supposed to go. And most of us, we take a preventative approach to pleasing God and to going after God. But God says, no, you can't put me to the test like that because I'm a God that's going to give you free will. If you order it, I'm going to let it deliver. But you better be glad. You better hope it's something that's on my menu because otherwise you're going to have to eat what you ordered. I felt that in my spirit. He sent a word. He says, come. Not until then did he move out of the boat. If he had moved out of the boat without that word, he wasn't walking on water. He was walking on faith. It wasn't his feet that was holding him up. It was his faith. And you can't have faith in the word until the word is released in your life. And so you're walking on faith, but your faith is in the wrong thing. You stepped out because you thought your 401k was going to catch you. You stepped out because you thought your hookup was going to hold you up. You stepped out because you thought they just looked good enough and they made enough promises that I know I'm going to be all right. And God says, no, that ain't me. So they can only hold you as high as they can take you. But when you get in me, Second thing, come on, I got to hurry. Second thing is he, he called for the word, but then he caught the word. He accepted something that doesn't make sense. You're going to tell me to step out this safe boat in the middle of a storm and walk on water. He said, yes. And guess what he did? He accepted that, even though it didn't make sense. See, the problem is you have tried to logicate God. You have tried to make an infinite God fit into your own small, finite rationale. Instead of trusting him with all of your heart, lean not to your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledging him and let him direct your path. And so you got to stop rejecting the word that he's sending and accept it even when it doesn't make sense. He accepted the word that was against sensibility and he actually accepted God's word over his emotions. Because all kinds of emotions set in when you start walking into the unknown, when you start walking on turbulent turf, when you start going out into a place, into a space that makes you uncomfortable, you have to wrestle with your emotions and you have to trust God above what you feel. Your faith ain't predicated on feelings because feelings will get you in trouble. Feelings come, feelings go, feelings change. But faith says, no, but God is constant. God is consistent yesterday, today, and forever. So I'm going to trust in what he said, even when I don't understand what I see. Are y'all with me? He went against his emotions. He trusts God's instructions and he moved. He got caught out. He got out of the boat. Watch this in the middle of a storm. He planted a church in the middle of a pandemic. He shifted the model of ministry to a digital platform in the middle of a pandemic with a black church. He watched 
the storm while an exodus happened and people got in their feelings and said, I'm not going to honor what God says because it don't make me feel what I want to feel. But he had to keep walking on the water anyway in spite of what he saw because he heard what God said. Can you do it when it doesn't make sense? Can you honor God's instructions when it doesn't feel good? Can you do it when the storm starts raging and you still keep walking forward? He accepted, he caught this word. God is speaking, but most of the time we don't want to hear what he says, so we reject his word and we put our, our substitution in there and then wonder why it still don't work. God specializes in the incredible. He commonly asks you to do things that are impossible in your own strength so he can show you I am incredible. He asks you to do things that you need to do even when you don't understand the need to do it. So God says, I want to take you beyond, beyond. There's so much incredible stuff. I desire to do incredible things for you. I want to get the glory out of your situation, your circumstance. I'm trying to show you who I am. I'm trying to show the people around you who I am through you. I have handpicked you because I believe that the favor that's going to fall after you come out of the storm is going to be so worth it that it's going to blow your mind and the people around you will be beneficiaries of just being in your proximity, in your presence, hearing your testimony and seeing your God. I'm trying to show you that I desire to do incredible things in your life but you won't let me because you won't receive what I am saying the last thing is that he carried out the word play man so I'll stop he carried out the word he, he caught the word and then he climbed down out of the boat in other words he caught the word and then he did the work. He worked to be obedient. Can you imagine? It's a storm. You in a boat. And he says, come. First of all, I've just gotten over the reality that you're walking on this water. That's the first thing that's messing me up. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to look underneath you and see what are you standing on. So I'm just getting my mind around that reality. And now all of a sudden, you tell me, you come out here too. How many of you? Oh, let's be real. How many of you? What it said? Oh, sure, Lord, I'll step out here in the middle of the sea. No, he had to work. He had to work through fear, doubt, disbelief, and anxiety. And his own logical understanding. He had to work to be obedient. But he carried out the word that was given to him. In other words, he made his mind up. He said, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. God said, do it. I'm going to do it. God says, do it. I'm going to do it. You know how many people told me that the video venue, the digital medium, that don't work in a black church. I said, okay, then we're we not a black church. We're the Lord's church. I don't care what color the folks are. I don't care where they came from. I don't care what color they are. I'm doing what the Lord said to do. I said, now how are you going to commute between Atlanta and here? That, that just doesn't make sense. I said, it don't. It really doesn't. Not to me either. But he said, come. Because there are millions that are waiting on what you carry. There are millions that need what... This is the catalyst. Remember that Atlanta is number one. We already have Houston. We already have Birmingham. Birmingham is so favored. They gave them a facility as big as the one that we in. And on top of that, people, he, I, I talked to Pastor Brandon the other day, who's the campus pastor there. He says, Pastor, I don't know what happened. He said, I, I can't explain it. He said, but now I need you to come help us deal with the growth. I said, what? He 
said, they're coming. I don't even know where they're coming from. He said, I can't tell you where all these people are coming from. He said, and now I need you to train my teams and help us. You, you got to equip me so that I can even handle the growth that is happening. When you step out of the boat and you do it because it's what God said do, you don't worry about the rest. You trust him in the middle of it. Let me tell you what. He started sinking. You heard the story. He's like, oh my God. Oh, ye of little faith. I can't believe that you doubted God. You started sinking because you know, I want you to read the text in verse 30. In verse 30, it says, when he saw the wind, when he saw the wind, he began to sink. When he saw, y'all don't get it? Lean in, come closer, no child left behind. Who can see the wind? You, you've seen the effects of the wind. You've seen stuff move because of the wind. But who can see the wind? See, if you're not careful, when you jump into it and you start moving according to God's purpose, His power, and His plan, You'll, the enemy is so tricky that he'll start making you paint pictures of stuff that you can't even really see. You've already seen your demise. You've seen the end of it. You've seen the failure. You've seen the faults in it. And you haven't even gotten in it good. And that's what caused him to sink. He saw the wind. He saw something that was supposed, that he wasn't even supposed to see. Fear is an assassin of faith. Don't miss the last thing. Last thing that he did, he's, Scripture says that when he began to sink, because he messed his perception up, when he began to sink, he cried out. He didn't cry, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I need you. Do a mighty work in this situation. No, 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 no. Lord, save me. That's all he said. Wasn't deep, wasn't heavy, wasn't long. Didn't have a B3 organ behind him. He just said, Lord, save me. And the Bible says, immediately. Why should I save you? All the stuff you've done, you did, you disobeyed me, you doubted me. I told you that you're supposed to have faith. You just saw me feed 5,000 with a fish and five loaves of bread. You just watched me do these miracles. You watched me in, 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 in Jairus' daughter's room. You saw me at the funeral procession when I touched the castle. You've seen all this thing, and yet you doubted me, and you disbelieved me, and you walked away from me, and you abandoned me. He said none of that. The only thing he did was reached out and grabbed him immediately he didn't even press pause he didn't give it a second thought it wasn't even an option the moment he said Lord save me he reached out and grabbed it. some of you today need to cry out to God because he hears you because he understands because he he feels and he empathizes with you he is familiar and acquainted with your grief and your sorrow he knows the pain that you feel and he knows how broken and how lost you have been he knows that you've been sinking he has seen you falling beneath the level of your privilege and all he's waiting on you to do is cry out and watch this it's not going to take as long as you think As soon as he grabbed him, watch this, he was immediately lifted back up. As soon as he touched him, immediately he was raised above his demise. As soon as he, it's not going to take a long time. God is able to do a quick work in your life. God is the kind of God, he doesn't take him a long time. He can bless you suddenly, immediately, and straightway. And so some of you today, this is, that's, that's what you need in your life. You need to cry out. It needs to be an open, audible. It needs to be a tangible. It needs to be a spiritual. It needs to be a deep utterance. Lord, save me. Save me from my doubt. 
Save me from my disbelief. Save me from myself. Save me from my brokenness. Save me from the confusion and the frustration of my yesterdays and the years that have passed. Save me from the things that have caused me now to disbelieve that you're able to do incredible things. Save me, God, for anything that has been a hindrance, anything that's been an obstacle, any distraction, any dark that has been launched at my mind, my heart, my hearing. Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Save me. I promise you that once you cry out to him, he's going to reach out his hand. And when he grabs you, every Everything in your life is going to experience a lifting. He'll lift you out of sin. He'll lift you out of brokenness. He'll lift you out of the pain. He'll lift you from confusion. He'll lift you out of depression. He'll lift you out of the sickness. He'll lift you out of the sorrow. He'll lift you out of yesterday. I need somebody to cry out to him today.